Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I have a special, a very special guest, uh, Father D. Mark White, uh, and he is the pastor of two parishes that he, he takes care of both of them, uh, St. Joseph's in, uh, in uh, Martinsville and St. Francis in Rocky Mount, uh, Virginia. Uh, and we're here today to talk about some of the struggles that he's had with those parishes. Uh, and and where we are trying to get to the truth and the best way to collaborate with the hierarchy of the church to be able to get there. Uh, so uh, we want to start with a prayer. So Father Mark, if you will, if you will give us a prayer, and then we'll. Mm -hmm. uh, In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, direct, O Lord, we beseech thee all our actions by your holy inspirations, carry them forward by your gracious assistance that our every prayer and work may begin in you and through you be happily completed. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Amen. Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, women. and blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, for sinners now and at the end of our death. Amen. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Francis, pray for us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And let me just add that if my tongue gets tied and I say something stupid, that <laughs> the Lord be with me and uh, make sure make sure I'm smart enough to correct it. Right. Same goes for me. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you very much. I appreciate I appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk to you today. Um, and and we'll get into the to the guts of this thing, you know, probably in about 20 minutes or so. Um, because you're you're dealing with a, a very difficult struggle, um, and and we just want to kind of outline it before we're we're going to go into into some of your background, uh, even even to childhood, because I think that's important to understand the way that people are built, and you know what is the what is the uh, the education that they've gotten and things like that. But can you just kind of outline what your what your issue is right now and, and where you're sitting right now in relation to uh, the church and the two parishes that you have responsibility for? Sure, thank, thank you, Dale. It's a pleasure uh, speaking with you about this. I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Uh, right now I'm suspended from public ministry by, by the bishop. Um, and at a little bit of an impasse when it comes to my work as a priest, especially at the parishes that you mentioned, uh, where I've been the pastor uh, since 20, 2011. Um, and it has to do with my weblog that I've been publishing now for well over a decade, but specifically with blog posts that I that I have published about uh, the McCarrick cover-up. Okay. All right. So. Um... So what is the main issue right now? I mean, what is the what is the disagreement between you and Bishop Nestout of the Virginia Diocese? Uh, Rich, the main, Richmond Diocese. Right, exactly. Uh, the Whether or not my blog should be available to the readership or not. Um, the way it's, we're, we're at a complete impasse where he won't restore my priestly faculties, which is what I need to do any assignment of any kind, while I still have a blog available on the internet or or while I still have any social media uh, accounts of any kind. Okay. All right. So so you're not able to conduct any uh, church ministry until you remove your blog. Is that is that basically the the dictum by by uh, Bishop Nesta? That's right. You got it. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's let's understand a little bit about who you are, because I think that I think it's really valuable for people to understand that there there are people making these decisions and and wielding authority or uh, being submissive to authority or whatever. And I think it's really important for people to understand where folks' heart is and 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 how they were raised and and why it is that you believe one thing and Bishop Nestau believes another. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit about about your uh, growing up, early years, family structure? Uh, you know, who are the people that are influencing you from a family perspective? Sure, uh, I, I had a blessed childhood. I grew up in Northwest Washington D.C., uh, right inside the city limits, in a neighborhood called Chevy Chase, which at that time was uh, middle class families. I was born in 1970. 
I have a younger brother, uh, just under two years, my junior. Uh, and for most of our time growing up, we, we had an intact uh, nuclear household with extended family in the area on both sides. I, I grew up among church going people. We, we went to church every Sunday. Church was a very big part of our lives. Uh, it was really like a second home for our family. And I grew up among reading people, people, my parents were always reading. We were always talking about books and reading together. And the Christian faith was the central theme of all of our life and study and communication. Uh, we I, we got, went to a Lutheran church. My, my mother uh, was Lutheran, my father Episcopalian. Uh, and uh, it was in college that I became a Roman Catholic. Okay. All right. So, so you were raised in the Lutheran Church, basically. I mean, that's where you got a lot of your your scripture understanding and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Absolutely. And what what moved you to the Catholic Church? Was there anything that that kind of stuck out in your mind where you said, okay, the Lutheran Church does one thing, Catholic Church does another, and I'm going to move in that direction? Uh, sure. Excellent question. Uh, I mean, I thought from my youngest days of, of of becoming a minister, I was really interested in in the in the minister and what he did and and how he did it. Um, and, but something just wasn't connecting for me in my teenage years. I thought about becoming a doctor and was a, became a little bit estranged from the church. But the, my family had some problems and kind of in my later teenage years. Uh, and I was working as an office temp downtown Washington and went out for a walk and got caught in the rain and ducked into a church. And it was St. Dominic's Roman Catholic Church, Southwest Washington. Okay. It just I ducked in there to get out of the rain. I think it's the first time I was ever in a Catholic church. And as soon as I walked in the door of that church, I realized that I was in the presence of God like I never had been before. And I saw really? the red lamp burning next to the tabernacle. I didn't even really exactly know what a tabernacle was, but something spoke to me and told me that that, that red lamp meant he was there. And I was washed over with this sense of God's presence and authority over me like I never had been before. And it was really the turning point of my life. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. And how old were you at that point? 21. 21. Okay. So when you walked into that church, was there a mass going on or was it empty? It was empty. It yeah, was I totally empty. It was totally empty. Yeah. So, so when you went in there, you had, did you, at that point, did you have the calling that we call the calling or did, or did you just think, wow, that's interesting. Maybe I should understand more about the Catholic church. I mean, I, I guess it tells you something about the way a 21 year old young man's mind works. I mean, it really was the calling, but it, it took me about another year okay. to really figure it all out. Uh, but all I right. was, I, I, I got, the, I, I met a Catholic priest and uh, talked to him about becoming a priest. Uh, and he explained to me I needed to become Catholic first. Right. <laughs> so I, which I then proceeded to do with with his help. Um, right now, yeah. now prior to that time, at twenty or twenty one, were you going to be a minister in the Lutheran Church? Well, or, I, I, so you were so undecided, or what was your what was your mind frame at that point? I appreciate the question. I, I had become. Um, somewhat alienated from the Lutheran church that I'd grown up in. Uh, for, for, I got to put it straight, I guess, for because of the sexual ethics, uh, uh, the, what we were not taught any, and we were taught not really to pay too much attention to them. And something in me told me that wasn't right. And, uh, right. and so um, I was looking for something that, that it, where there was a, clearer and stronger moral teaching um, I gotcha. and, and i and i knew that the the pope at the time john paul ii was teaching that that kind of doctrine and that did attract me okay so when you say when you say sexual ethics you're talking about the way that the that the lutheran church dealt with sexuality is that right. what you mean which was really not to deal with it at all i mean to, to okay. let more or less let the culture define uh, right, the sexual morality. Anything's okay. You don't have to be married. It's okay. You know, whatever you want to do, that's 
Okay, and that that didn't quite set with you. Right. Yeah, and I, I saw what, what a disaster it was for 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 everyone around me. Uh, you know, not to have some kind of guiding light. Right. And it, and and I and and from the my earliest years, I, I, I was fascinated with with the Lord Jesus Himself and the Gospels, and um, it, it it seemed clear that He was demanding of me and, and of us a, a higher at least a higher aspiration than than free sex right right okay so so when you were growing up let's go back to like 14 or 15 i'm sure yeah. you're not hanging around with a whole bunch of people that are looking for jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> so how yeah. do you, how did you get to that point what was it was there anything that that was in your upbringing that said you need to follow this path yeah well our closeness to the church and the and the the liturgical nature of the lutheran church at least the one that i went to it was very similar to the way that we celebrate the mass and so just having the the weekly readings from the gospels they 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 started resonating in my mind i think from a very early age I mean, it was a great gift and so i, I had a really clear picture of who jesus christ is from when okay. I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old. Um, okay. Did at that point did you have a Bible? I mean, were you the kid oh. that went home and read read <laughs> what was what was read in church and go, okay, explain this to me, mom? Or <laughs> well, it's it's funny you should ask that because what I would do, I had a little Casio stopwatch, and so I would time the sermon. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> like ten, eleven. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and so, so I knew exactly how long the sermon that I had heard was. Right, right. And then I, would, I would go home that, you know, after lunch, I'd kind of go up to my room, close the door, and then try to talk about what we read for that exact same period of time uh, to see if I could do it, see what I would come up with. Right, right. So you saw yourself as giving homilies? I mean, is that what you did? Instead of, instead of the person that went up with the with the hairbrush as the microphone, you went up with the hairbrush to do homilies in your bedroom? <laughs> That's about it. Yeah, you pretty much got you're, it. You're, you're quite the nerd, aren't you? <laughs> yes. That's for sure. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. What a great story. What a great story. Uh, did you have any other passions when you were growing up? You know, in late in teens or, or into your high school? I mean, what else were you into? Uh, basketball. I mean, basketball okay. was it was my second life uh, for from 10 years old to 18 years old. Okay, and you're you're fairly tall. What are you, 6'3", 6'4", something six three. like that? Yeah, 6'3". Yeah. yeah, well, now you're 6'1", but you, you lie about that, don't you? Like every other basketball, basketball player. So were you any good? I was okay. Yeah, I mean, I, play, I played on the high school team. I wasn't good enough to play in college. Okay. But, yeah, I was, we, and we, we, we won some championships. I, I was okay. I, I, defense was my forte. Okay. All right. You were a shot blocker. I, I could block shots. Yeah. I'm okay. All out. right. So let me go back to Washington. Was there any government connection? Because I, I have this, this impression that everybody who lives in Washington has some connection to the government. That's the only right. reason why you would live there. Right. I mean, was that a connection with either of your parents or is it just, you know, I mean, there was just a, a normal suburb like I experienced in Buffalo, New York? Uh, it's funny you should ask. It, it, not, neither of my parents worked for the federal government in any way. My, my father worked for the city government. I, my brother and I are actually sixth generation uh, native born Washingtonians. Oh, wow. Which is getting pretty unusual. Wow. Yeah. I didn't even think there were six <laughs> generations. <that were. laughs> right. So that's all the way back to colonial times, I guess, or pretty close. Uh, the beginning of the 19th century, yeah. Okay. yeah. And we, uh, our ancestors were in Maryland prior to they moved into the wow. into DC and at the beginning of the 19th century. Gotcha. But but my, actually, my father's work was one of my other interests as a as a young person because he was a, a real estate uh, lawyer for um, commercial development of large office buildings in downtown Washington. Okay. So he and I would ride around town together, and he'd point out the sites where they were going to build new office buildings and describe the architecture right. and stuff. And I, I loved all that. I found it really interesting. Now, was was it the architecture side or the legal side that that interested you? Well, kind of a combination, because it was uh, to to get a, an office building built. It's it's the Washington D.C. is the most highly regulated uh, commercial development 
right. uh, area in the country because uh, the, the height limit is very strict and the the use uh, proportions of the building are very strict. You have to have um, commercial and residential in addition to, uh, you know, storefront. You have to have an addition to just pure office space. So right. the way that the architects and the and the Board of Zoning Adjustment will work together to, to try to compromise. That was my dad's business, and I found that pretty interesting. Right. Uh, right. Very good, very good. Um, any other significant childhood events that led you to this point that we're going to be talking about here shortly? Uh, is there um, anything that you say, boy, I'm glad I went through that when I was 14 or 15, because at least it informs me about what, what decisions I need to make and what actions I need to take? Yeah, I mean, I appreciate your your asking that question. When I when I was in seventh grade, I'd started a new school, and uh, and you called me a nerd. I was known as the geek of the week at that school like, for the whole year. <laughs> so you uh, wanted multiple weeks. <laughs> exactly, I wanted to practice the whole year. But okay. the, the English teacher we had, who was kind of tough and brusque with us, demanding, but ultimately very loving. It, it, every every few Fridays we had to write a poem and and present them and it was all boys, uh, so it was a, a moment of great vulnerability for all of us. But one Friday <laughs> I, I wrote a poem about Jesus Christ, uh, devotion to him, and I read it and I started to weep and I I, I couldn't really help it. You know I was just kind of right. moved with the emotion right. of the poem, and instead of derision the class showered me with affection and it was wow so yeah. they started clapping or exactly yeah yeah now you were you were like 12 is that about right, right? you said seventh grade exactly. okay now you said yeah. you said all boys did you go to an all boys school uh i, I did from seventh to tenth yeah the uh, school my father had gone to an episcopal boys school okay yeah. all right and then and then what other education did you have so that was you said Seventh to tenth, right. and then where did you finish? Where did you finish up your high school? I finished up at a, at a co-ed school called Edmund Burke, where my mom was actually a teacher. It was right around that time I mentioned earlier that my family did start having problems. My my parents wound up splitting up. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, so, and are yeah. they both still alive? Your mom and dad? Uh, my mom is. I we lost my dad twelve years ago. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Um. So so you went to the public high school. Uh, it was the, 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 private. Private school also, actually. It was yeah. a private school. Okay, yeah. but it was co-ed. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right, so then after after education in high school, one of the things that confused me is on your, on your Facebook page, you have Catholic University, mm -hmm. but I couldn't find a seminary. So was Catholic mm -hmm. University also your seminary? It was. I mean, you, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. so you can go, you can go to Catholic University and just go as a regular student that's not that's not moving towards the priesthood, or you can go right. in another program that has a seminary feature to it. Am I understanding that correctly? You're absolutely right. Yeah, and I, and I, I graduated, uh, undergraduate from there as a lay student. I became Catholic during that period of time. And okay. then uh, I wound up teaching um, middle school for a couple of years in Baltimore, okay. and then returned to Catholic University as a seminarian uh, to get the theology degree. Okay, so that's interesting. So when you went to teach middle school, were you still thinking about the priesthood, or were you still uncertain at that time? Uh, I, I, no, I, I did it really as a way to prepare myself for the priesthood. Okay, I was a member of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. Um, I, the the priest that I had first met was a Jesuit priest, and so at, at, I was just associated with the Jesuits from when I entered the Catholic Church, and so the, I had in mind that I would become a Jesuit priest. Uh, okay. It didn't, didn't work out that way in the end, but I, I was with the Jesuits at a, in that first stage, uh, teaching at a Jesuit school in, in Baltimore before I went okay. to The only thing I know about the different um, areas, you know, the Jesuits and the Dominicans, uh, the only thing I know about the Jesuits is that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Pope Francis is a Jesuit, mm -hmm. and they had a lot to do with education. They're, they're, when, when I think of Jesuits, I think of education. Is that a fair thought, or is there, is there yeah. more to it than that? Yeah, no, that, I, they're, they're, that is a fair thought. Um, the Jesuits are also famous for the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola, okay. uh, 
which is a way of praying um, that when you do when you're a Jesuit novice and Jesuits help other people do it. And it uh, it's a great asset to the church, the, the spiritual. Okay, the, the, a different way of praying. Is that what you said? Well, it's it's a particular set of uh, meditations that St. Ignatius developed. Uh, okay. That ideally you spend 30 days in silence doing them. Uh, there's other ways of doing doing them too. Uh, they're based on the Gospels, uh, but it, it's, they they really change your life. I, I mean, I was able to make to do the 30 days in silence in uh, in the January of 2000, uh, 1997, and that uh, it was certainly like the foundation of of my spiritual life. Uh, now, is that a is that a retreat that you go off to, or do you do it yourself, or I mean, how do they normally organize it? Uh, you can do it either way. I, yeah, I did it as a Jesuit novice, so we, we did it as a retreat, uh, a retreat house. Uh, but the, the Jesuits and people have been trained by the Jesuits help anybody who want, wants to do the spiritual exercises, do them in any way that they can. So right. another way to do it is actually spending an hour a day for a year. Uh, you can you can ha achieve the same thing if you give yourself you. an hour of silence a day for a year. So either I can be silent for an hour every day for a year, <laughs> right. or I have to go 30, 30 <laughs> days without speaking. <laughs> right. Well, you know which one I'm going to choose. <laughs> That's interesting, though. I'm gonna I'm gonna look that up. That looks really really interesting. Um, okay, so when was the moment that you committed to the church? Okay, so it sounds like. You would always you would always seen yourself as somebody who was shepherding other people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, being in your room trying to figure out how to how to write a homily and then deliver it. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you were always kind of in that mode. What, but was there one key moment when you said, "I want to be a priest and I want to be a priest in the Catholic Church"? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it, it was within that year after I had that experience at St. Dominic's uh, with the Blessed Sacrament and. I started going, you know, more and more to mass, and one eventually became Catholic. Um, and I was uh, at that point, I was really sure that the, the the Lord was calling me to to become a Catholic priest. Yeah. Okay, and and at that point, you were at uh, Catholic University. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, when you went to Catholic University, did you go directly into theological studies, or what do you what do you major in when you go to a, a a place like that and you're ready to be a priest? Uh, well, I, I actually wound up majoring in English literature and minoring in Spanish literature. Um, okay. And then then when you go back for um, theology studies, then you, you do a full, full scale theology program, uh, which is what I did when I went back as a seminary. So, so is it a four year period to get your undergraduate? Like when I went to the State University of Potsdam, I get four years. So it, you get a you get a, a bachelor's, and exactly. then you go and then you go and get the, the the specific theology. Exactly, you got it. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So so when you went into um, when you went into the theo theological program, um, were you in the seminary at that time? Is that what they say when so you get your yes. you get your BA or BS and then you go into seminary? Correct. Right. right. Okay. You got it. And, mm -hmm. and you were and you were still on campus there. They had a exactly. special they had a special area where all the seminarians would would learn together. Uh, there's a, there were different residences for seminarians depending on on your affiliation. That, like I was a diocesan seminarian studying for the Archdiocese of Washington, and so the largest okay. seminary building was the diocesan seminarians. But then there were other seminary buildings, like for the Franciscans, Dominicans. Oh uh, really? So they're yeah. broken. They're broken down by that. If I wanted to be a, a Dominican, I would go to a, the the Dominican Hall where all the Dominican right. seminaries mm -hmm. would be. Okay, exactly. So, uh, just for my own curiosity, it has nothing to do with any of this, but why is that? I mean, what is there significant differences when I say Jesuit or Dominican? Isn't it all the, the same Catholic Church? Uh, yes, I mean, fundamentally, and, and the, we would take classes together because the, the basic theology instruction was more or less common right. to all the different uh, groups. Right. But the, the different orders have their own particular way of life and their own what they what's called a charism the gift that was given to their founder to live yeah. in a particular way to bear witness to the gospel by by their way of life you know so the gotcha. they, um, 
that's what distinguished the, the, like the Dominican house or the Franciscan house had a much more structured way of life in the house than we did. Not, not that ours wasn't, we had structure, but right. not to the extent that, that they Like had. specific prayer times and specific rituals that would happen throughout the day that everybody would have to participate in. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. And also the way that they would be, um, what what's called formation, which I mean, the to when you if you're going to be become a priest, you have to receive the education, but you also have spiritual uh, human uh, formation by formators, people that are over you, right. kind of watching over you and evaluating you. Gotcha. And, the, and the, if you're in a religious order, you, your formators are of your order. I got gotcha. you. Know I, mean? uh, I got gotcha. you. Uh, about the only thing I'd be able to to understand that with is I'm going through. Uh, I was honored to be asked to be a godfather for mm -hmm. for one of the one of the gals that I've known for a few years. Um, and the formation is these people who are talking the same language is what we're trying to get my goddaughter to understand. We're all talking the same language and we're all in the same room together. And, you know, so we, we understand where they're coming from and, and how to answer questions based on their, their way of thinking about things. Right. So exactly. that, that makes, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Okay. So uh, there was one incident that we wanted to bring up, which was uh, the fact that you got kicked out. Right. Okay, but I want to I want to go back to your early childhood mm -hmm. to ask ask a question, and this is a temperament question, and then and then what we're going to do is we're going to go ask your mother, uh, because she would have a different <laughs> she would have a different a different understanding of what your temperament was when you were a kid, um, but it had something to do with fundamentalism, and we're gonna I'm going to ask you to 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 tell me what happened there, uh, because. It's it's terrible when I say, well, you got kicked out. But when I when I understand it, it's it's it seems to be almost nothing. But I do want to I do want to bring up what your temperament was. So when you were when you were growing up, it, it seems like you had a very um, almost idyllic growing up until you said your 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 mom and dad broke apart. Um, but did you were you strident? on anything or were you just kind of were you kind of floating along and you were okay with everything did you have a short fuse did you have a long fuse um and and what was your temperament and did that have anything to do with the fact that um uh, that you became in the at least the eyes of some people a fundamentalist which i don't know whether that's a good or a bad thing right so yeah. So no, I hope I, I hope that was that was a terrible question, but just kind of throw <laughs> go into what was I like as a kid, and right. did it affect me when I was going through seminary or college life? Right. No, I appreciate it. It's a really good question. I, I, I think I was generally a pretty quiet kid, but I, I I I was a perfectionist, and and that got me in trouble to be sure. I mean, and I, I was cut out. I mean, I, when you're taller than everybody else, it, uh, they tend to look to you to be in charge. And so I, I naturally was more or less of a leader. Um, and and sometimes I was a, a strident kind of leader, like a uh, overly demanding, unsympathetic uh, kind of leader. I think when I was young, um, that's definitely a fault I had to work on. Uh, okay. As I, tried to mature yeah okay um, now now explain this fundamentalist thing that, right. that you got involved in when you were in seminary well uh, okay uh, but people, you, had, you had told me that you were already you were already ordained as a deacon correct is right. that right so so explain that to me so you go you get your you get your college degree you go into the seminary and then how many years does it take you to become ordained as a deacon? Uh, three a years. Deacon. Generally speaking, after three years. Okay. Uh, and you said and traditional de transitional deacon, which means right. I'm a deacon, but I'm tr I'm going to be a priest. Correct. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So right. what was the period what was the period when the professor said whatever they said about your fundamentalism? Right. It was it was after I'd been ordained a transitional deacon, which is which is in a sense the definitive commitment made on the part of the, the man himself and on the right. part of the church towards the man that if once you, when you're ordained a deacon, it's the, the, you, you give yourself over and make your promises and the church more or less 
accepts right. you as a candidate for the priesthood. And, and the, now, now unless, because, because I kind of explored this, if I wanted to be a deacon, I could stop at being a deacon, right? I could just yeah. say, so as far as I'm going, I'm not going to be a priest, probably because I'm already married. Right. Is that, okay, because we have deacons, we have deacons at, at both uh, Our Lady of Zan Nazareth and at St. Andrews. Um, exactly. So, so you can be ordained as a deacon, and that's the stopping point, or you can say, I want to be a priest, and you right. have to go through the deacon year or whatever to become a priest. Is that exactly. correct? Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. after you got ordained to be a deacon, they said, Father Mark, the deacon Mark, I guess at that point, <laughs> right. is a is a fundamentalist, and that's a bad thing, and you had to go to some kind of jury or something. So right. just explain that so we can move on, because like I said, I don't think that's significant, but we do need to address it. Right. It, it was a long term conflict between seminarians and and scripture professors at the time at Catholic University. It was part of, of that um, where the seminarians, generally speaking, were not particularly interested in the, the higher criticism of the scriptures uh, that had developed in the 19th century in Germany. And we were, we were prepared to accept what's, what the scriptures say as being basically true which some people, including the professors at the time, thought of as being fundamentalist, which it, it doesn't exactly mean that. If fundamentalist means closed-minded, unwilling to right, consider right. the findings of history in, in your interpretation of the scriptures. I mean, I don't, I'm not one, and I don't, I don't think any of us were, we seminarians who had this conflict with the professors. But I mean, long story short, once I was ordained a deacon, one of my professors asked me point blank, do you believe that the flood occurred? And I said, my answer was, well, I don't see how we can say that it didn't. It's, it's what the scriptures say. Right. And so, uh, right. Right. Um, and for the, that, that response that was, moved him to write to the archbishop that uh, asserting that I was a fundamentalist. Yeah. So, okay. okay. <laughs> now, now, did they do this on a weekly basis? Did they pick somebody out that said, "I read the inerrant Word of God, and I believe"? You know, you you even you even qualified it more than I would. You know, no, the flood happened. It's, but right. you said, I don't know how you could argue that the flood didn't happen. But I mean, was this a regular occurrence? I mean, were you? Did they have to do this to one person every semester or something just to make a point or? I, I mean, why, yeah. or was there any reason why you were picked to go through this? I mean, because I would assume that a lot of people would have answered that same question in the exact same way. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's no, I stuck my neck out. I mean, certain people faulted me for, for not being more prudent about sticking my neck out at that point on this and being willing to have this open disagreement with this particular professor. Because because it was a little, I mean, everybody, the, I, I shouldn't say everybody, but most of us seminarians, uh, we kept our heads down to get through. I mean, it, it was a little, right. what you're saying did happen. I mean, there were right. exercises of, of purging the seminary of, of traditional candidates, um, you know, that would happen sporadically to keep everybody afraid of being too openly traditionalist. Okay. We're going to set that one aside. <laughs> Because I think because of my because of my interest in traditional Catholicism, we're going to set that one aside because I think you probably have more to say about that that I'm very yeah. interested in hearing. Sure. We'll just have to decide whether we want anybody else to, to hear that part of it. Uh, but that's but that's really interesting. And uh, um, well, yeah, we'll just set that aside. I'm not even going to I'm not even going to comment on it right now. OK, so. Um, so we we talked a little bit about your temperament and your background, your educational background and that kind of thing. Do you have do you have any other um, traits or events in your past that kind of molded you to the person that you are today? I think you, people who are reflective and, and very introspective, which you strike me as being uh, 
periodically tend to look in their back back in their past and say, you know, that's an event that really changed me that I had a, I had an opportunity to take a fork in a road and I decided to take this one. And that's why I am who I am right, right now. Are there mm -hmm. any, any other events that we missed that might be uh, illustrative for the people who are listening to, as we get into some of the current problems? Yeah, well, I appreciate that question. I guess I would say when when I first went to college, I actually didn't go to Catholic University. I went to Williams College in Northwest okay. Michigan, where my father had gone. Okay. And uh, it's to this day is known as the cranking out the most powerful people in in the U.S. per you know per capita, basically the highest really? income and. Um, so, I mean, I, definitely that my my I was at semester I was at Williams for three semesters, and kind of what you're talking about is kind of what happened at that time. I mean, I I just knew, not, and I had great affection for my friends at that time, and they, they're they're running the world in a very educated way right now. Really, really. <laughs> I mean, the ones who I are. I never even heard of the college. You know, I mean, this, so so that so where are most of those people going? Are they going into government? Are they going into industry? Or where are they? Uh, investment banking was the big oh, one okay. At, okay. Uh, you know, at that at that time. I think it still is. I mean, now that's thirty years ago, but a lot of people were going into investment banking. Right. At that time. And, okay. And uh, why didn't you stay? What what happened at the end of the third semester that you well, said? I mean, the, the whole time I just I, I love the people as people, but it just was not. I knew I, I didn't belong in that world. It just I, I, something was tugging me very strongly in another direction. Um, right. And I, I thought about things like just leaving and becoming a truck driver or a, or maybe a police officer. I wanted I wanted to live a different kind of life um, than what the place was was preparing people for. Okay. Um, and, I, and I think that's what and that's that's when I first. Um, came in contact with the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, which have been my okay. companion, really, life lifelong companion since then. Um, right. And I, I, I just wanted to understand where he was coming from, uh, and because it, it just what he was saying seemed so profound and insightful to me. Um, but I knew I needed a kind of an off ramp from the track I was on to, to get there. Uh, right. Right, and Catholic University is in the D.C. area. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's well, kind of you came home, but then you you decided that that would be a good place for me to pursue what felt more real to you or more truthful to you than than being at well, Williams College. When you were at Williams College, what were you what were you aiming at? Because it sounds like it sounds like you may have went, and I want to put words in your mouth. Did you go to Williams College because your father went to Williams College? Or did you much. go to Way Did you go to Williams College because you wanted to be a priest? No, I, I no, I definitely didn't go to Williams College with the idea I was going to become a priest. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, so it was kind of a, a a deviation, and then you finally got back to where it sounds like you were always heading. Right. Yeah. That, I, that's very well said. Right. Okay. Yeah. Did your father Did your father have a problem with that? At first, yeah, it's funny because it, I mean, he at first he was really confused by what I did in my early twenties. Um, but he, he, you know, he, he loved the church. He was a faithful son of the church and, and he respected the Catholic church. So when I became Catholic and then wanted to become a priest, he, he, it, more and more, he just accepted it and actually came to really love it. And then shortly before he died, I received him into the church. So he, he died. A Catholic. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That must've been a proud moment for you. It was, yeah, it was yeah. really beautiful. Yeah, very good, very good. 